in a blatant and desperate attempt to seem far more rational than they actually are, Christians and Muslims will often show you a list of famous scientists who believed in God, as if such minds are entirely on their side. For example, Galileo, Kepler, Newton, Faraday are all normally found on such lists, giants of science who all called themselves Christian. But all of them died long before the atomic age and the discovery of the God-confounding mechanisms of pure chance that rule all quantum reactions. They never heard of DNA, spectroscopy, redshift, stellar nucleosynthesis. They never heard of protons or neutrons or the laws that govern everything these particles can and cannot do. They never heard of radioactivity and the window this provides for measuring the ages of rocks and thereby our planet. Newton, living 400 years ago, may have believed as many Christians and Muslims still believe today that life cannot come from non-life. But that's only because nobody in the 1600s knew that our bodies are made entirely from non-life in the form of atoms. Would Faraday or Kepler who endorsed the biblical creation story have their minds encountered the explanatory power of the DNA molecule, the data behind the rates and causes of genetic mutation, the vast timescales involved, not to mention the highly detailed mathematics and observations that underpin 21st century cosmology. We'll never know, but there's plenty of statistical evidence to suggest that in the information age at least, the more you know, the less likely you are to believe that the creator of the universe cares what you do with your sexual organs, or which direction you pray in, or even if you pray at all. In an attempt to make up for this embarrassing lack of modern scientists prepared to sign up to an even partially literal interpretation of any holy book, the Christians and Muslims, or affiliated sociopaths, will tell you about recent surveys where many modern scientists have gone on record as saying they believe in God. But this too is extremely deceptive. The scientists in these surveys are only asked if they believe in God, a question so vague as to have 6.5 billion meanings. If the survey asked them if they believed in hell, or in a god who wants women to cover their hair, the ticks would become crosses and the believer would dismiss the survey as god-hating propaganda when all that's really changed is the question asked. How many scientists in those surveys who put a tick in the god box don't really apply their science to their religion? How many of those on the list are physicists, amongst whom belief in a personal god is almost non-existent? How many are deists who don't believe in a god who keeps the buses running on time? How many just tick the box to keep mum happy? How many other scientists, simply by ticking the god box, carelessly allowed their vague sense of spirituality to be confused by a religious nut job as an expression of belief in their vengeful, mass murdering, ego maniacal god? If we removed from the list all those scientists who don't believe in hell, I wonder how many names would remain. I think the long list would become a very short, very unimpressive one. Whatever such surveys say, only a tiny, microscopic proportion of qualified, reputable scientists believe in what the believer would call god. The fear perpetuating religious bigot calls this breathtaking arrogance on the scientist part. They call it pride, ignorance, denial. But what most of the religious have never and never will understand is the real reason why the scientific mind can dismiss their threats of hellfire with an amused smile. How can scientists be so sure? Why aren't the scientists afraid? Why don't scientists fear hell? What makes the scientific mind so completely immune to this and so many other fears that haunt so many other people? For once, cut away the bullshit. The holy books tell you that you will burn if you don't believe. That is what the scriptures explicitly and repeatedly say. It couldn't be clearer. Even today there's no more painful way to die, let alone to spend eternity, and that alone should tell you why the threat is in the holy books in the first place. But let's look deeper still, through scientists' eyes. We've all been hypnotized by flames. Fire has a unique kind of magic. For most of human history, fire was magic. It's no surprise that it was the gods' tool of choice when the gods, worried by dwindling or fickle support, eventually and inevitably went into the eternal torture business. It's no coincidence that the biggest religions in the world threatened the greatest punishments for disbelief. We've all stared into the flames, but what's actually happening? What exactly are we staring at? What is fire? Fire is a chemical reaction requiring three components an oxidizing gas, usually oxygen itself, a combustible source of fuel such as wood or petrol, and a source of energy sufficient to heat the fuel to its ignition temperature. This energy can come from matches, sunlight, friction, lightning, or something else that's already burning. When wood, for example, is heated to about 300 degrees Fahrenheit, 
The cellulose material starts to break down and give off volatile gases. When these gases reach about 500 degrees Fahrenheit, the heat energy overcomes some of the electromagnetic energy, binding the atoms to the complex molecules found in wood. The molecules begin to jiggle apart. This releases smoke, a gaseous compound of mostly hydrogen, carbon and oxygen atoms. These briefly free atoms are then suddenly and violently drawn by electromagnetism again to combine with oxygen atoms eager to share electrons with elements with one or two to spare. This reconfiguration happens almost instantly. Fire is a brief outbreak of chemical freedom as atoms and molecules race to rearrange themselves into the lowest and therefore most stable energy states available. In the process, atoms release the energy they no longer need for stability in the form of light. Firelight is just the same as any other light. Trillions upon trillions of wave-like particles called photons hitting the back of your eye. Photons are emitted by electrons as they change energy states. Each photon is a packet of electromagnetic radiation exchanged between particles like currency during quantum transactions, always precisely balancing the conservation equations of quantum mechanics. The flame is just a gas heated to the point where the atoms shake so much they spit out light. Fire is an electric phenomenon. The color of the flame, the frequency of the wave-like photons, which is what color is, depends on what atoms you are heating and to what temperature. The different colors within any flame are caused by uneven temperature. The hottest or more energetic part of the flame usually glows blue, a higher frequency than the less energetic frequencies, such as orange or yellow. The heat you feel is the excited motions of the atoms in the air around you and in your skin and flesh. Heat is simply the motion of atoms. At the lowest temperature possible, minus 273 degrees, atoms stop moving pretty much altogether. That is why no lower temperature is possible. You can't have less motion than none. In living tissue, when atoms jiggle too fast, they hit other atoms too hard, creating pressure that can damage cells, resulting in pain signals sent along nerves to your brain. If something hot burns you, some of your atoms simply jiggle too fast. Fire, or combustion, is the process of oxidization. So is rusting. In a way, when a car rusts, it is burning in super slow motion. If it weren't for the fact that we have evolved to make use of oxygen's reactivity in our biochemistry, you could say oxygen is damn dangerous stuff. That was, briefly, how a scientist sees fire. The actual understanding goes far, far deeper. But what does it all mean? It means that without atoms and other subatomic particles and laws, there can be no flame. Rigid physical laws make fire possible. Anywhere there is fire, there will also be electricity, solid matter and oxygen. If hell were real, we could watch TV or escape into fresh air. You're not going to burn after you die. If we go anywhere after death, we go there without our atoms. And when the religious try and keep the fear in you, it's like a test. Is your mind strong enough to see through it? Do you know enough to laugh? Can you tell mindless bullshit from facts and reasoning? If someone tells you that you're going to burn in hell and you demonstrate that you understand exactly what fire is, I guarantee that they will then tell you that the fire in hell is not like real fire. The flames need no fuel or oxygen, electrons or photons, but it burns just the same jiggling atoms that aren't there. In short, they're telling you that the fire in hell is magic fire. Religion only exists because most kids believe in magic and all adults were once kids. Welcome to organized religion where everything means nothing and nothing means everything. Where knowledge is ignorance and answers only lead to confusion. But just as those least likely to believe in magic are professional magicians, those least likely to believe in the supernatural are those with a firm understanding of the natural. You don't have to be a scientist to have scientific understanding. Learn and be free. Into your mind. Fight for it.